Yo, what's up? It's been three months since I uploaded my initial M1 MacBook Air review in regards of doing some serious video editing. And since then, a lot of things have changed. Not only has Belle gotten her 13 inch MacBook Pro with 16 gigs of RAM, but she also replaced her old 16 inch MacBook Pro with it and is doing all of her video and photo editing on this machine. We also recently had an extended trip to Italy as well as France and we were shooting a lot of content, but since we were traveling around a lot, I didn't want to take my iMac, so I only took my MacBook Air to do all my video editing for YouTube, some client work, and of course she also took hers. So now after a couple of months, what's my verdict of these M1 MacBook Pros? Are they really capable of doing everything that everyone promised in the beginning? And I obviously was really impressed by those machines in the beginning as well. But spoiler alert, some things have changed and I'm not 100% sure if I can still recommend those. So I will talk about all of the things that I found wrong with it and obviously also some things that I have confirmed that are really good with it after the intro. My name is Damien Cooper and welcome to Monkey So before I dive into the nitty gritty, let's start with a little disclaimer. It's still a very cheap laptop. I paid less than a thousand euros without taxes for it and Bell paid less than 2000 for it. And that is basically not even half of what she had before with her MacBook Pro 16 inch and now she's doing all of her video editing on it. So just throwing that out there when I'm saying some bad things about those machines, but those are some pretty big deal breakers for some people me included, so let's just start. So we wanted to use our M1 MacBooks like we would use any other laptops or basically any other computer. So when traveling, I usually hook it up via HDMI to the hotel's TV. And when Belle is working at home, she's working with a 32 inch external monitor and plugging in a lot of hard drives, RAID systems, etc. And that's how we used these computers for the last couple of weeks or Bell for the last couple of months. So my first and one of my biggest problems that I also mentioned in my initial review, which I actually thought it would have sorted itself out by now, which apparently it hasn't, is the missing plugins. Especially when editing these YouTube videos, but also for a lot of my client work, I use a lot of Motion VFX plugins for Final Cut Pro 10. And if you're a Final Cut user, you should definitely check them out as they are totally awesome. So I leave a link in the description below for you to check out. But some of them work and most of the new ones work too, but some of them, they just don't. And what I love about them is that you have a built-in mocha tracker. So it's so easy to track text or pictures or basically social media callouts or whatever you wanna do to objects within your footage right in Final Cut. And it's just so easy. And none of these mocha tracked plugins work with the M1 Mac as of mid-March 2021. I reached out to Motion VFX and apparently there is a workaround so you could actually start Final Cut in x86, so the old version, and then they would work, but that would definitely slow down your entire process. And then I don't really see the benefit of having a M1 MacBook if I'm just running the Intel version. So yeah, a lot of these plugins work, especially the newer ones, but the ones that I'm using, the ones with a built-in mocker tracker, currently don't. And I'm honestly not 100% sure if they will ever work or if the technology which has the mocker tracker just isn't able to translate to the new M1 Max, which would be a damn pity because as I've already said, I use them in almost all of my YouTube videos. Furthermore, there's also some other third-party plugins like Need Video, for example, which is an awesome denoiser. And especially when shooting RAW on a Canon C300 Mark III, I use that actually a lot because RAW doesn't have any in-camera denoising, so this one comes in very handy. And it states on the website that you can run it in Resolve, for example, natively, but in Final Cut, you have to force it to translate from Rosetta. And I tried that and for some reason it didn't work. So I spent around 10 minutes on it and I didn't get it to run. So so still, as of right now, I don't think it really works. 
So not all of the plugins work, which is a big bummer for me. This is an absolute deal breaker. Belle doesn't really use most of them all the time. And once in a while when she does, she just uses my iMac and that's fine for her. Next one, and this could also be a really big problem. And we found that to be worse on the 13 inch MacBook Pro instead of my MacBook Air for some reason. And that is the ports. And I'm not talking about the ports just having two USB-C ports, but the ports seem to be really underpowered. So what do I mean by underpowered? Bell is usually using a hundred different SSDs and HDDs when she's editing. So she needs to plug in a couple of different devices at a time. And oftentimes she plugs in an SSD and when she plugs in a second SSD, it just doesn't mount and the computer doesn't recognize it. If she unplugs the first SSD, the second one pops up. So that leads me to believe that they're just not powered enough for some external devices. And the same was true with one of our RAID systems. I tried hooking up one of the RAID systems to her 13 inch MacBook Pro and sometimes it did get recognized, but then after about 10, 15 minutes, it just unmounted and I couldn't mount it anymore. And these, problems we had with different kind of devices, even when using external hub devices that actually are powered by themselves, it still wasn't enough power. And when trying to hook up and daisy chain different kind of hard drives, sometimes it just didn't work and you can't really use all of your external peripherals with a 13 inch MacBook Pro. And this is obviously a really big problem. When we were in France, Bell wanted to just do a simple task, copy all the stuff from the CF Express card over to her external SSD. So when plugging both of them in at the same time, it just didn't recognize both of them at the same time, or she constantly got some copying errors when trying to copy the footage from the memory card to the SSD. So now she plugged in my SSD RAID into her laptop and then used the card reader, plugged it into my SSD RAID and then used her external SSD and plugged it directly into the computer. And now everything worked fine. And that kind of confirms my suspicion because my SSD RAID is not only bus powered, but it also has its own power supply. And that probably just supports enough power for everything to run fine. But without it, there just wasn't enough power. So that would leave you to believe that using an external USB hub that is also powered by itself would solve all these problems. But as I've mentioned earlier, for us with the Elgato Thunderbolt 3, for example, which is powered by itself, it still doesn't work. And she can't plug in multiple hard drives at the same time without some of them failing or just not mounting. I generally didn't have any of these problems with my MacBook Air, but that could be due to several reasons. The MacBook Pro has a brighter screen, it has a touch bar, it also has a better battery life. So overall, maybe all of these things just draw too much power and then there's just not enough left for the Thunderbolt ports. But again, this is all just my theory, but in reality, we just ran into these problems and I don't 100% know why, but again, this is my working theory. Another issue Bell runs into from time to time is that the computer just crashes. The display goes pink for a second and then it just shuts off. And then it just usually restarts again and everything works fine. But that is obviously annoying. And I'm not sure if this is an M1 problem or a software issue or a mixture of both. So now that we got the big problems out of the way, let's talk about the minor issues that we found on the M1 MacBooks. So we had some export issues. Sometimes when exporting into H.264, which is the codec that we usually use for client delivery, as well as for uploading to YouTube, some portions of the video actually came out really compressed and pixelated. I had this one YouTube video that I exported in France and uploaded to YouTube and about 20 seconds of it was completely compressed and pixelated and I tried multiple times to export it and every time in the same spot it was the same problem and that was strictly R5 footage but then when trying to export the same video from my iMac at home it worked totally fine. And Bell ran into some similar problems and she was using C300 raw footage as well as R5 footage. And when exporting her video, it came out a little bit compressed and pixelated. But again, this could be a coincidence. This could also be a Final Cut error or something else, but we only had these on our M1 MacBooks and not on our iMac. So here's another potential issue that Bell brought to my attention. When she's closing her MacBook Pro 13 inch and putting it into her backpack and the backpack is kind of full so there's a lot of pressure on the laptop, then the keys actually press into the screen and might damage them in the future because she had that problem on a 15 inch MacBook Pro where it completely damaged the display. 
I don't think that's an issue with the MacBook Air because it just closes a little bit better and before the unified bodies, way before that 10 years ago, there were no problems at all. But with the 13 inch MacBook Pro, this actually might be a problem. So just to be safe when putting it into your backpack, maybe try putting something between the screen and your keyboard. So now that I talked about all these little or sometimes even big issues, let's talk about our experience of actually working with the M1 MacBooks and doing some serious and heavy video editing for quite a while now. If you've been following this channel for a while now, which I hope you do, then you know that my main camera is the Canon C300 and I shoot most of my videos in RAW. But I also use my Canon EOS R5, shoot in H.265 but sometimes even in 8K RAW. And overall the editing experience, even on my really low-end MacBook Air, was surprisingly well. Not only for the price tag, but in general. I could definitely see myself editing with it and I actually did for a couple of weeks. But then sometimes when editing for a longer time, my performance took a huge hit and I couldn't even play back anything smoothly anymore and I don't really know why because I didn't change anything. My theory in the beginning was that either it overheated, but looking at my sensors in the iState menu tab, uh, it just didn't. And then I thought that I might be running out of RAM because this machine only has 8 gigabytes of RAM, but even those were never really exhausted. So maybe iStat Menus just doesn't really cooperate very well with the M1 MacBooks and those claims are false and it was still overheating or I was running out of video or even just regular RAM. But overall, I don't know, sometimes it just started lagging and stuttering and it was really unpleasant to work with. But again, I'm using raw footage, I'm using Canon footage from the R5 and overall it worked very well. But overall when talking to Bell, she kind of confirms my findings that overall it's really pleasant and smooth to edit with, but it's not as fast as her MacBook Pro 16 inch that she had before, but overall she generally has no problem. She can't play back 8K RAW out of the EOS R5, but she has absolutely no problem of editing multiple streams of the R5 or the R6 footage. I also asked her about the noise on her 13 inch MacBook Pro and basically the fan just never spins up unless you're exporting raw footage. And that is definitely tolerable because on any other laptop that we had before, even when starting Lightroom or Photoshop or just starting Final Cut, you could hear the fans ramp up. And on the 13 inch, it really never does. And we sit in the same office close to each other and I can never hear her laptop when she's editing even raw footage. Only when she's starting to export, there's the fan, but even that is somewhat quiet. So now, after using these machines for a couple of weeks for our main drivers, what's my overall verdict? Well, it's difficult and it really depends on what you do. Do you need these plugins? Do you need a lot of external hard drives? then I don't think the M1 MacBooks are for you because for me personally, for the work that I do, I could not live off of just an M1 MacBook because I just couldn't work. I just couldn't do the things that I would usually do with my iMac, not only for the performance, but also for all the plugins that I would be missing. And I probably couldn't even use two of my rates at the same time, which obviously is a problem as well. However, if you're a video editor that doesn't do as much heavy editing as I do, for example, if you're not shooting on raw footage, if you're not using a lot of plugins, then the M1 is actually an amazing tool to edit with, even with an external monitor or just off of an external SSD. But if you use multiple SSDs and backup solutions and raids and plugins and all that kind of stuff, then I don't think the M1 is for you. Especially now that we're probably really close to a second generation of M1 MacBooks or even iMacs, I would probably hold off by purchasing one of the current machines if you do some really heavy video or photo editing. For everything else, I really love my M1 MacBook Air and I take it basically everywhere. I was even sitting in a waiting room and cutting a C300 Mark III multicam sequence just to the raw cut while I was sitting in the waiting room. So overall, I really like this machine, but for me, it just couldn't replace my 2020 iMac right now. So this was my overall verdict. I hope I didn't bum you out if you were in the market for one of these machines and now you might have changed your mind, but hopefully I could help you make an informed purchase decision. And if I did, then please give this video a thumbs up because it really helps the channel grow. Subscribe for more and I hope to see you on the next one.